everybody. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us. And uh, uh, welcome to this round table on the current situation in Haiti. Um, I want to start by saying, Bienvenue tout le monde. Um, my name is Felix Stein. I'm a senior researcher at the Department of Anthropology here at the University of Amsterdam. I hope you can all uh, hear, hear me really well. And I wanted to begin by thanking all of you for attending this event, uh, both in person and online. Uh, my special thanks go out to our panelists who are all here uh, with us today. Thank you very much for sharing your time and your knowledge with, uh, with us. We really appreciate it. Uh, I also wanted to uh, thank Hannah Horvath for co-organizing this event, uh, as well as the Department of Anthropology and the Center for Conflict Studies at the University of Amsterdam for uh, supporting our discussion today. Um, this event came about because colleagues and I are conducting research on the anthropology of reparations, uh, as part of uh, which we will be writing about Haiti over the next few years. Um, yet, as you all know, Haiti, uh, is, which is in many respects a beautiful and fascinating country, has been going through a series of profound and unimaginably hor horrific crises uh, in recent times. And to mention just a few aspects of these crises, uh, as far back as 2018, uh, widespread political protests took place uh, against government corruption in what became known as the Petro Caribe corruption scandal. Uh, that same year, a sudden increase in fuel prices led to further protests, and shortly thereafter, rapid inflation greatly undermined people's food security across the country. Uh, at the time, the tenure of former President Jovenel Moise was marked by mass killings of civilians, by armed gangs, and poor parts of Paul Klaus. And these gang attacks were both state-sanctioned and they included the widespread use of sexual violence against women. Uh, Moise also overstayed his mandate without organizing elections, but was then assassinated three years ago mm -hmm. in his residence by Colombian mercenaries uh, under still largely obscure circumstances. His successor, Ariel Henry, remained in power unelected uh, for the past two years, providing further space for the growth of gangs in the capital. Uh, and under the govern, uh, governments of both Moïse and Henri, the rapid rise of organized crime has come with increasingly frequent and indiscriminate kidnappings and killings. Uh, and this March, uh, the situation deteriorated further as two of Haitian of Haiti's main gangs took control of around 80% of the capital, including major prisons, ports, and the international airport. Uh, and as a result, very little cargo moves through the main port, uh, a terrible problem in the country, which is a net importer of food and, of food and fuel. Uh, now, following these recent escalations, Ariel Henry resigned exactly a month ago, handing power over to a, tra a transitional presidential council, uh, which is to name the next government. And this council should be formed according to a plan drawn up by the 15 member states of the Caribbean political community, CARICOM. It is supposed to include members from Haiti's political parties, civil society, and major businesses. And it's supposed to name an interim prime minister and an inclusive interim government or council of ministers. Yet it's unclear whether this will happen. Uh, one problem being that major, arm, major armed gangs in the country have political ambitions. And the other problem being that Haitian political and business elites have been uh, supporting these gangs in the past. Here to help us make sense of this complicated and often heartbreaking situation uh, are five speakers who together will provide perspectives that we don't hear in the news very often. Uh, they will share both first-hand accounts of what uh, life in Paul Pass is like today, as well as social science insights into the drivers and effects of the current crises. And we are profoundly grateful and deeply honored to welcome our panelists. Uh, they are Professor Cécile Asilian, uh, Professor of French and Francophone Studies at the University of Maryland. Um, professor Asilian has written and co-edited several books, including Teaching Haiti, Strategies for Creating New Narratives, and By L'Audience, Haitian Popular Film Culture. And amongst many other engagements, she currently serves as the president of the Haitian Studies Association. We also welcome Dr. Yambi Exontus, a Haitian radiologist at the State University Hospital of Haiti. 
Uh, he teaches medical imaging at the State University Medical School and runs a private practice in Paul Pass. And born and raised in Haiti, Dr. Exxon Tous has assisted several national and international organizations in the areas of education, healthcare, and leadership. Another warm welcome goes out to Rose Amber Hyman. Uh, Rose is a social worker who founded the startup Peace Cycle that aims to provide dignified employment for people in Paul Pass. Uh, Peace Cycle is located in Delma 33, so in the heart of the capital, where its local staff collect and upcycle the four ounce water bags that litter the streets of the Haitian capital. And Peace Cycle works to transform these water bags into high quality clothing and accessories, and it aims to empower and celebrate its staff in the process. We also welcome Arshali Mondesir. She is uh, operations director at the NGO IT Communitaire which supports local organizations through its community center uh, near Paul Pass's International Airport. And IET Communitaire has provided a space and equipment to hundreds of local organizations in and around Paul Pass since 2010. And it has also at times provided language and sexual and reproductive health education to people of the area and served as a hub for vulnerable children and young people. And last but not least, we're delighted to hear from Dr. Regine O. Jackson, uh, Dr. Jackson is Professor of Sociology at Morehouse College in Atlanta, Georgia, where she also serves as the Dean of the University's Humanities, Social Sciences, Media and Arts Division. Dr. Jackson specializes, among other topics, in Haitian migration and diaspora studies. Uh, she is a former president of the Haitian Studies Association, and among many other publications, she's the editor of the Geographies of the Haitian Diaspora, and author of Boston Haitians Navigating Race, Place, and Belonging in a Majority Minority City. Uh, now, each of the speakers will uh, take the floor for around 10 minutes, and then we'll open up for questions from the floor, and of course, I'll ask the questions online. Uh, so, please, if you have a question, please write it in the Zoom chat. Uh, and I wanted to remind everyone that this uh, event will be recorded and then posted on our website from where you can share it with anyone who you think might be interested. Uh, and we'll begin by hearing from Professor Asilia, who will speak about some of the key domestic features that drive the current crisis. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Felix, and thank you, Hannah. Bonjour, bonsoir tout le monde. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for putting this together. Thank you also to Alessandra Benedicti Kaken for recommending um, me to be part of this panel. Whenever I'm in a space where I'm asked to speak about Haiti, I often want to take some time for us to intentionally reflect upon our sisters and brothers who are living in these horrific conditions and her role as permanent delegate representing Haiti and UNESCO. Ambassador Dominique Dupuis gave a very moving speech in which she describes Port-au-Prince, and I quote, as une capitale qui se transforme en tombeau béant a capital that is turning into an open grave. In that spirit, I ask that we pause for one minute in solidarity and respect for the women, children, youth, and men who have had to witness and face such atrocities where their lives are not respected and they have lost their basic rights and dignity as human beings. So we're pausing for one minute, please. Thank you. I'm going to briefly highlight a few of the issues that has led to the current situation. I do not like the term crisis to talk about what is happening now. The noun crisis from the Latin form of the Greek word crisis means turning point in a disease. And the implication is that during that period, the disease could get better or worse. How can this situation possibly get worse right now in Haiti? Rather, 
I want to invite us to refer to the situation as a calamity because the term calamity refers to a disastrous event that is marked by great loss and lasting distress and suffering. We cannot, in good conscience, talk about this calamity without contextualizing it. It did not start in 2018 or 2010. The long journey that led to this current calamity started with colonialism and continued in various forms of greed, corruption, colorism, gender inequity, gender-based violence, class and capitalism, to name but a few issues. This calamity is caused by the four to five percent elite, political and non-political, who are parasites and continue to sell Haiti piece by piece to the US, France, Canada, other members of the so-called core group, etc. In 2018, Haitians took to the streets to ask about the Petro-Caribe Fund that was supposed to help the country with development and the sector of education, healthcare, and other infrastructures. And this was just one of the highlights of the ongoing calamity. This calamity is also a result of the lack of infrastructures at various levels. As an educator, I will highlight the lack of infrastructure in the education sector primarily. Schools are being burned currently, archives and other patrimony are being destroyed. When you don't have school, how can you tell these kids that they belong, that they are citizens of a country when there is no real infrastructure in place to take care of their basic needs and fundamental rights. For the majority of Haitians living in Haiti, their linguistic human rights are violated as they are not being educated in their native language, which is Haitian Creole, and this lead to all types of issues including self-repression, self-rejection, self-silencing, etc. This calamity is also caused by a lack of decentralization. There is so too much centralization on Port-au-Prince. As a result, the country is crippled when Port-au-Prince is crippled. People forget that there are other ports that can be rehabilitated and upgraded. For instance, Cap Haitian serves only about 10% of the population. Why not consider putting together port infrastructures in Lekai, Port de Paix, Miraguan, etc.? This calamity is also caused by the armed trafficking that is unregulated and by those Haitians and non-Haitians who are inundating Haiti with arms to serve their own interests to the detriment of the people. This is by design, let's be, let's be clear. I often remind people that Haiti does not produce arms. Where are the arms coming from? Primarily from the U.S. This is, of course, connected to the issues of gang and gang violence which impact gender-based violence, and we see how women are collectively being raped. Rape is used as a weapon. The gang violence is creating further instability, and we think especially of the youths who find themselves in situations where joining a gang is the only way for them to survive. And the situation of the gangs is complicated. We can talk about it in the Q&A that will require a whole other um, conversation. Some people have referred to the gang as terrorists or they have called them revolutionaries. And that issue of the gang violence, it's very layered and cannot be simplistically put in a binary of good and bad. The calamity that I refer to is also caused by the lack of infrastructure as it relates to roads. When you don't have roads, you cannot take your goods from one place to another. Therefore, your economy is crippled. This calamity is also made possible by the double debt that Haiti has had to deal with. 
Many of us here are familiar with the fact that Haiti had to pay friends in order for it to recognize its independence. And a few weeks ago, I was actually listening to France 24, France 24, and in referring to Haiti, their headlines was permanent chaos from Pearl of the Antilles to Mad Mask in a very sarcastic and ironic tone. There has been a lot of talk, and I stress the word talk, about reparations. But let's be real, folks. France is never going to return that money. But the questions that should be asked regarding reparations are the following. How can France at least create infrastructures in terms of roads, electricity, and education? as an attempt at this form of reparation over um, 200 years later. Who can make them do it? In November 2022, the New York Times had a special report entitled, and I quote, The Roots of Haiti's Misery, Reparations to Enslavers, whereby they did a very detailed analysis on the double debt. They were able to show the history of the debt, who gained from it, and how it continues to impact Haiti. We know who many of the descendants of the families who received payments and profited for, from these debts. We know them. They spoke to the New York Times. For instance, Crédit Industriel et Commercial, one of the leading banks, benefited from an 1875 loan to Haiti that helped finance the Eiffel Tower. In fact, I was in France last week for a conference on Haiti, and I was very tempted to go ask Macron to return the money, but I couldn't get in contact with him, so that didn't work. The New York Times investigation estimated that the 21 billion debt is really worth 115 billion in lost economic growth over time. As an aside, I also find it very ironic that Haitians had been saying that the, what the New York Times said in 2022 for over two centuries, and very few people pay attention to the Haitians when we have been saying that. But then again, that's how power works, right? The U.S. also stole money from Haiti. It's not just France. During the American occupation from 1915 to 1934. So let's follow the money. Money is power. This calamity is also caused by the so-called help that Haiti is giving during the various multiple occupation. For instance, let's not forget that there has been no compensation for the cholera outbreak. Ban Ki-moon declared, and I quote, the U.S. has a moral debt towards Haiti. That was it, nothing else. The calamity is seen in the brain drain. To the Biden humanitarian parole program, that started in 2023, Haiti has lost countless number of um, people who have been pushed out. For instance, more than 1,000 police officers have left the country. Several um, educators, both K-12 and university professors, have left the country. And this is not a criticism. I live in the U.S. and I have no right to criticize anyone who is trying to survive and run against gang violence and want to leave a, like a decent human being. The calamity continues as the US, France, Canada, Core Group, UN, CARICOM, etc., are deciding what is quote unquote best for Haiti and hypocritically claiming that there should be a Haitian solution. Yet they have been supporting a weak Haitian state that is unable and unwilling to protect its citizens. How can there be a Haitian solution when Haitians are not at the table or only very few Haitians are there and many of them only for their own um, personal gain? I will end by bringing attention to this last calamity. As many of you know, and as Felix mentioned in his introduction, the Transitional Presidential Council created by CARICOM, US, Canada, and all the players has had as its objective to quote unquote establish priorities, provide constitutional and institutional reforms and elections, and have the accord of a National Security Council of Haitian expert that will oversee agreements on international security assistance, including on dispatch of the UN back mission, end of quote. Beautiful words. They love using big words. I was beyond appalled when I saw that the council did not contain any woman who could vote. So there will be no gender perspective. 
Women such as Anna Kaona, Zabet, Marie-Jeanne Lamartinier, Catherine Flon, Sani Beller, Paulette Poujoloyol, Yvonne Sylvain, Madeleine Sylvain, Marie-Thérèse Colimon, Myriam Merle, Magali Marcelin, Anne-Marie Corriala, and countless others must be turning in their graves right now. What a slap in the face to the thousands of women who constantly fight and who literally and figuratively give life to these male decision makers. Until there is real gender equity and parity, Haiti cannot have true and sustainable development. Aïe Bobo, merci. Thank you very much. Um, our next speaker is going to be where with us. Lerby was going to provide a health perspective on the current situation from Paul Pass. Bonjour, bonsoir tout le monde. Hello, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure for me to be here with you. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, I've divided my interventions in, intervention into two parts. The, first of all, I'll be speaking, I'll be sharing a broad healthcare perspective on what's happening on the ground in Haiti right now. And I will be ending by sharing a more personal perspective on what's happening and how the current events are affecting my, my life. Um, let me start by repeating something that Dr. Asilien said earlier that um, Haiti is a very centralized country. Everything goes through Pope France. Pope France is the economic engine of the country. Um, the banking, the banking headquarters are in Pope France. The insurance company's headquarters are in Pope France. Um, the biggest hospitals really are in Pope France. The hospital where I'm working at. Uh, the uh, Asian State University Hospital, who offers the widest range of specialists in Haiti, is in Pau Prince. Um, the fuel storage for the whole country is in Pau Prince. So right now, this area is controlled by gangs, and it automatically means that we have a nationwide fuel shortage right now. Most doctors are located in Pau Prince primarily for economic reasons, but it, it's the situation. So some patients, if they need a, a, a certain kind of surgery, if they are residing in the countryside, they have to come to Paul France for that surgery. There are test labs. If you need them, you have to send the samples to Paul France or you have to travel personally to Paul France. So whenever Paul France is in trouble, the whole country, is in trouble. Um, right now, the hospital I told you about is a battleground. Gangs are using it as a fortress to fight the the police force in in Shanmas because they want to take they want they want to break into the national palace. I I personally think it's gonna be they want to make that a, a symbol of their power right now that they have taken over. 80% of the Haitian capital. You can't basically go nowhere in Pope France right now without having the specter of the gangs over your mind. Um, in a, 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 on, a personal, on a personal note, um, my life is not really different from what it was, I would say, two years ago. As Dr. Cecile um, um, Dr. Asilien said it earlier, this situation is not new. We are witnessing a spike, a drastic spike in the violence that has consumed the country for over, I would say, maybe 30, 30 to 40 years now. Uh, I would say it's a new cycle of violence. But it was, it, it's not that we are used to it, but with the recent spike, you know which area not to go, which area, uh, which areas are a little left, a, a little, a little safer. I happen to work right now. My private practice happens to be in the the twenty percent that uh, the gangs are not controlling. Um, probably yet, we never know. So that's why I'm not jobless right now. But I have countless colleagues. Who, who, are, who stay at home right now. They 
they can't see patients, they can't go to their clinics, they can't go to the hospitals because those those facilities are indeed located in the um, 80% controlled parts of Paul Prince. Um, now it's, uh, you can drive around, the banking system still functions in the the twenty percent that is remaining, you can still go to the supermarkets, but they have to close early because we have we have that um, that curfew that starts at six p.m. right now, six to seven p.m. right now, and you better not break that curfew. You better not find yourself in the streets because the police might mistake you for a gang member and shoot at you. Yeah, it's it's that bad. Um, I remember five years ago when I started working with. Um, the CARIS organization, a CARIS international organization. I was working as a consultant and um, ultrasound trainer for them. I, I, had, I, I had to travel all around the country. And it was a very, a very special experience for me because I got to, um, to really behold the, the beautiful landscape of, of the country. It's, Haiti is very beautiful. The nature is very beautiful. So whenever you get the chance to explore the country, via the roads it's it's a unique experience and i remember a, a couple of years in um the into the project it became increasingly difficult for people to travel the woods because at that point gangs started controlling the woods they would shoot at whole buses of people they would start shooting at buses of people and and I, I, um earlier dr asinia said that people are referring to those gangs as terrorists and this is this the kind of actions that lead people to think of the gangs as terrorists when you are um looting a hospital when you are closing a hospital that is deserving the poorest the general hospital in haiti is sometimes the only chance for the poorest in haiti to get a, a heavy surgery for example without ending bankrupt right after that when you are burning schools, when you are burning libraries, it's uh, it's difficult not to qualify those acts as terrorists. And I can understand that um, some of them are forced, really forced, um, to be a part of that. They have no choice. It's the only thing they know. Um, if you live in Village de Dieu, one of the strongholds of the ISO is a, a big... Um, a, a, chief a, 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 a big gang leader in Paul Prince, some of those kids, if they are 10 years old right now, all they know is gang violence. All they know. The models that they have in those cities, in those areas, are gang leaders. The leaders they know are the gang members. So that's the situation right now. Um, another calamity that is, that is going on right now is the massive exodus of healthcare healthcare practitioner, practitioners. Doctors are living in troops right now um, because of family pressures sometimes, but mostly because they are losing hope because um, it's difficult to give care when you don't feel safe. It's difficult to do that. Um, it's sometimes at some areas, it's almost like wartime medicine where the 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 input that you need to give the best care are not available. The ports are controlled by gangs. The airport, the, the air traffic, 90% of the international air traffic goes to Paul Prince. So whenever a plane lands with vital medicine, with vaccines, it lands in Paul Prince. And those medicines, vaccine, have to be dispatched all around Haiti to the countryside. So right now, there are plenty of cities on the countryside who are lacking of critical input to provide the, the care that the population needs. It's a, it's, it's a calamity, actually, as, as Dr. Axeter Axinia put it. Um, I think we desperately need help. Um, the situation has reached proportions that, that surpasses, um, that have surpassed the, our, our our capacity right now, the current police capacity, the army capacity, even the population, um, we can't, we can't um, fix this um, by our own. So we need help. 
We need all the help we, we, we can find. We need poems like that where we can share the word so the world um, could know uh, what is happening um, and help us and help us how they can fix what we are, what is occurring right now. Um, I think I'm going to stop here because um, there, are pl um, there are many of the things that I wanted to touch on. Dr. Dr. Axenia touched on them. Um, thank you for having me, guys. Thank you very much, Levi. And we'll continue with Rose, who will provide us with a social business perspective from the current crisis in four points. Greetings. Greetings, everyone. Uh, just to check, Felix, am I, can you hear me? Okay. Um, I just want to say thank you so much to both Felix and Hannah, who put so much work into making this happen and patience in organizing all of us in our schedules. Um, I just have to begin by saying when I am asked to speak on anything in Haiti, I am very, very humbled, and I also, I recognize my position. Um, I am not Haitian by blood or was I raised in Haiti. I have been living primarily full-time in Haiti for the past decade. Um, but I just want to say that I, I recognize fully that I have uh, less experience, less knowledge, and certainly don't have the answers. And I just want to begin with that reality that it's very difficult to be an outsider speaking on a Haitian topic. And um, I'm humbled and I will speak from my personal experiences and also just from my love and passion for Haiti and the Haitian people and hopefully um, advocating for situations in that regard. I am currently speaking from the United States. Um, I have been, um, I was here in the US and when some of the chaos has begun to be a little bit more severe so there has been no way to enter back into Haiti and it seems a wise idea to stay out for a little bit. Um, I am going to, I think with this blurred background it's a little bit hard to see so I will, I'm going to show you a few things. So I actually am sitting here in a tiny studio apartment and this is a lot of product that I have shipped here to Haiti. So I'll share a little bit about what we do. And part of the problem, which already Felix has spoken about, Dr. Cecile spoke about that, like the shipping and things in and out of the country is really at a standstill for the most part, which complicates any kind of social business that requires that we sell our products. So um, essentially, I started a small business. These are water bags that we drink out of in Haiti. You bite off the corner and drink out of it like this. Um, it creates a lot of trash. A few examples of what that looks like is distributed all over the ground. And what we do is we collect it, teach people about the environment, that it shouldn't be thrown on the ground, and try to give people dignifying employment to create um, worthy things that are that are durable products. We make tote bags uh, to take to the supermarket, little wallets, things like this, all out of um, these plastic bags. So. Essentially, it began as a small project just to give dignifying employment, um, like I said, teach about the environment, and then the idea was to sell things locally. Unfortunately, the average local population doesn't have the income to purchase uh, products that are handmade and created in such a time-consuming way, um, but we had a lot of other people that could make purchases, expats that were living in in Haiti, um, some people that came for uh, medical groups or things like that that had come. So it was a pretty small business and we were we were self-sufficient um, prior to when things began to escalate. So one of the questions that I think uh, Felix was hoping to address today is just kind of the difference between then and now. And as both of our prior speakers have indicated, there isn't per se a then and a now, but there's a spectrum of uh, of the gray that has turned, unfortunately, darker and darker um, in, in recent years. But so things were okay to some level that we could sell locally. Anyway, the change has become significant in the fact that we have zero customers locally at this point. So we had to shift to exporting um, products in order to maintain a sustainable business. Um, 
that has been quite complicated because we were working on that change at the same time that uh, shipping issues and things came about. So as Larry pointed out, he said he blessed that he currently lives in the 20% um, that the gangs have not quite occupied. Our workshop is about two kilometers from the airport, um, very close in the heart of the city, right across from Lopita Lape, which is uh, also the the um, National Laboratory uh, location. But that doesn't always mean that you're safer. As a contrary, as Larry pointed out, the medical is often something that's been um, a target of the gangs and of, of manifestations of all kinds. So we're located in that area currently. We are blessed to be still working. Um, from the beginning of when we created the workshop, we very deliberately decided to hire people only that can walk within 15 minutes to arrive at the workshop because it is quite complicated um, in even good times to find transport and to pay for transport and to wait for transport. So being a distance from your workplace without your own personal transportation, even with, is quite complicated and time consuming. So with that model, we have been blessed in these recent days that we are still able to work. But as I say, every single day is a risk evaluation. Every single day for every single person in Haiti, each day is a risk evaluation. Do I leave my house today? If I do leave my house today and I lose my life or if I'm kidnapped, um, what does that mean for the rest of my family? I mean, each person is thinking of these things on a daily basis. And for sure, as someone who is asking people to come to work or providing an employment for them, that burden also falls um, to say, is is this, which which outweighs the other? Is having a job and a purpose and an, and an income outweigh the risks that could cause you to perhaps lose your life? And um, I know that that's something everybody has to contemplate every day. And that, the mental the mental burden and the emotional burden on each person in these times is more than the average person in the world can really even um, comprehend. And I think that that's something to acknowledge um, when we talk about all the things uh, that, uh, I mean, again, other speakers will speak more on, on the different groups and um, that are trying to make changes in the political status. And I don't, I don't feel that I have a platform for that, but, the reality is we can talk about the things that we see, but what we don't see is the mental and emotional. I mean, it's very complicated because there is no one who doesn't know someone who has been kidnapped or who has been robbed at gunpoint or who has had to flee their home um, because gangs came and took over their neighborhood. And and those numbers are increases, increasing on a daily basis. So um, I... I was asked to speak a little bit about what it was like before and what it is like now as a business. And sometimes I think what people forget too is the trickle down effect. So we are blessed that we are in a place that we can work, but the materials we need might only be available in places where people cannot work or getting things to the port, for example, to ship them out. If there is a ship might be in a location that we cannot get to. So everything is isolated and everything becomes quite complicated um, with the trickle down problems. And I think something that's very strange and it's actually, it's a problem that I always wanted to happen. Uh, and we always said, we hope to be worked out of a job because this plastic pollution is quite a problem. But these bags are drank primarily only when people are out and about. Right now, people are not out and about. So when you go to school, when you have a, a choir rehearsal for church, when you're out buying products on the street and in the market, um, that's when you buy these uh, mobile sources of clean, potable water. And um, so even finding those is becoming less because also where you can find them are often dangerous areas. So something, it's just that every every entity of the problems in Haiti affects um, other other aspects, I would say. Um, Larry also mentioned, I keep gleaning from other people's uh, wonderful 
words they said and but that the banks are operating and money is available in that 20 percent, perhaps but something else is we're working on two different two different um monies here i get if i sell things in the united states for u.s dollars then i have to have it in in haitian gourds the banks don't have any u.s dollars etc 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 and these kinds of problems like i said one compiles on top of the other um I kind of wanted to follow a little bit of the same model as Larry as well with sharing some of those general issues, but then focusing a bit on the personal end. So as someone who does not exactly blend in, I feel that my presence can create a danger for the people I work with. So I try to be very cautious that I do not create an environment where they may be um, a target if they're known to have be working with a foreigner. Of course, you can't be too careful. But in most recent times, I really, I live and work at the workshop and I do not leave because of safety concerns, not just for myself, but the safety concerns I would put other people into by being um, connected to me. I. We're going to have questions and answers. I'm happy to speak to anybody even in, in a separate section as well or happy to give my email um, with any other things. But I do want to just end with, it was also asked, what can happen now to improve the situation in Haiti? And I will say, from a humble space, I think I can speak on behalf of the world. If there's anyone who thinks they understand the problems of Haiti and thinks they have a solution, the only thing I can say is they are probably wrong <laughs> because the, the, the problem is too great and too deep and too long lasting. Um, and for sure, me as someone who has really only entered um, fully into the Haitian life only a decade ago, I would never say that I have grounds to speak on what should happen. Um, I will, again, second what both speakers ahead have said, and I think Larry said at the end, it's beyond our capacity now, and we do need help. But as Dr. Cecile also said, that help um, needs to be in a way that empowers the Haitian people to solve their own problems. So outside help is for sure necessary. The police are overrun. Um, but what what people really, truly, truly, truly need is security. No one can operate as uh, the doctors. I, I, I wrote it down. Um, it's difficult to give care when you do not feel safe, Larry just said. And I think that that is a quote that could go for everything. It's difficult to have a grocery store open if you don't feel safe. It's difficult to work at the bank if you don't feel safe. It's difficult to operate a social business if you don't feel safe. Um, and I think that security is very, very much needed. And I think that the idea of business and eco economic growth is so vital to the growth of any any nationality, but also just individual people. We all need the dignity of being productive parts of society. And that's what I feel so strong about is to be a part, um, a productive part of society. You, Yes, part of that is making money, but part of that is making something, making your community better, knowing that you're doing something. And unfortunately, right now, even those who wish to do that um, are really stifled. And I think security would would give them the chance to make the changes in their community, start the businesses in their community and change the world in their community that they would like to do, but maybe cannot at this time. But thank you again for including me and happy to answer questions later. Thank you very much, Rose. Um, we we'll move on to uh, Arshay Mondesir at IT Community. Okay, so good morning, everyone. Bonjour tout le monde. So this is a pleasure to me to be part of this panel. And as Felix said, I am Arshay Mondesir. I am operations director in. AT Community. AT Community is a community 
uh, resource center located in Klesin, uh Poro Points. Um, I'm sorry. It was launched in March 2010 and has helped support hundreds of organizations by providing office space and uh, job of space and general support. Our mission is um, to support local projects that promote solidarity, sovereignty, and community in partnership with and um, with different community leadership. So we explore and engage innovative ways to effect, effectively, effectively meet the long-term needs the community needs. So we aim to help our partners better meet the needs of the beneficiaries while taking care of these logistics, including office space, security, and spaces to offer training and workshop, water and electricity. Our base is currently home to several organizations. Together we form a community when we can share resources and seek solutions to aid in sustainable development challenges. So back in the days, um, AT community, um, we saved a lot of founders, organizations that come to Haiti in order to help young people um, to have a manual profession and to have English class and to, to have a lot of uh, manual professions. But um, I, I think after 2015, so this kind of activities are closed because we can't receive foreigners in Haiti. Uh, the insecurity uh, is uh, become worse. So it's really, really bad to receive foreigners to come in Haiti and have this kind of activities. So now our activities based on went office space and uh, we have accommodated um, some children that come far in Poro points and they need to come to to hospital they need to have a surgeon so we accommodate them in our base in order to help them to go to hospital and now since uh february 29th our activities are closed until further notice, no one know when we can reopen our activities. And um, as we have a lot of people on the base, over 120 people, most of them are the member of organization that we are in partnership with. Uh, they are driving out on their arms. So we accommodate them in our base. And this is really joyful for them and for me too, because me, I am in the base too. I am on the base too. So it is really bad. It is really difficult to go out in order to have what we need on the base. Um, it's that to say when we need food, water, and a lot of things that we need, we're supposed to, to know if the area is safe, if we can go out. Uh, is that to say that to say if we don't hear gunshots in the areas, though, we know that we can go out in order to have what we need. And I think um, we need to have our preparedness plane emergency. It's just because in a situation that security is absent, you're supposed to have a plan. You're supposed to prepare because a lot of things can happen in a, secu in a situation that security is absent. And uh, we plan to have um, an extra food. And we plan to have uh, extra water and uh, extra fuel like diesel, extra um, gasoline and propane in order to su survive in that situation and uh, we, we
the biggest problem that we have is the insecurity because if you don't feel if you if you are not safe if you don't feel how you are secure so you can't you can't work and i can say a lot of uh, many organization many or uh, organization have left aed it's just because the insecurity and when they have left aed that means many people find themselves unemployed and when many people find themselves unemployed, that means the poverty is increasing. And um, we will have more children on the street and we will have um, a lot of people out and they are homeless. And um, we can say this is a, a stressful situation. And for me, um, if I can say what should happen in order to improve this kind of situation, primarily I can say the security is the restoration of the security. And because it's, it's because the insecurity, our activities are closed today. We can receive children to come to their program in order to educate them. We can receive um, our partners' organization to come to to work on the base in order to provide um, the help that can that they can provide to the community. And it is not a life that we are living in Haiti because it's really stressful. You have you have a limit when you want to go out, when you want to to, to buy food, when you want to, to, I don't know, to 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 I can say when you want to um find uh, something to relax, when you want to go uh, to hang out with your friend, you can't do it. You can't do this, and we can't go to um to go to the supermarket. We can't go to the bank. We can go anywhere. I think that if we have uh, security, I think that we can we can we can improve in that situation that we are through. And um, for me, this is what I can say: we need security. And if I don't know how we are going to. Uh, we are going to restore it, the the security in Haiti, but we need security in Haiti to improve that situation that we are through. So thank you for having me, and it's been a pleasure to speak. Thank you, Ashley, and we'll um, we'll uh, move on to Dr. Jackson, who's going to speak to us about the impact of the political situation on the Haitian diaspora. Thank you so much, Felix, and um, thank you to you and Hannah for organizing this this space and um, creating and holding this space today. Um, I, I think I, I felt in her voice um, the the exhaustion um, in Dr. Cecile Asilien's voice when she spoke, in part because very rarely do we have. Um, spaces like this where such a variety of Haitian voices are represented. And that that is an important part, um, what I think of as getting toward a solution is having a broader conversation that includes um, Haitians in Haiti who are um, dealing with the current situation, this heightened violence that we haven't we haven't seen this kind of violence um in haiti since um i would argue since 1986 right and so people who are currently experiencing this violence after waves and waves of um violence and political instability it's important that their voices be at the table um but there's also a role for the haitian diaspora 
it used to be that when I was asked to speak about the Haitian diaspora, I would talk about how the Black community in the United States was not monolithic. Today, I want to talk about how the Haitian diaspora is not monolithic. There's incredible diversity in terms of generations, class, political ideologies, gender, citizenship status, geographic location, religious identities, different access to resources and privilege, and political um, and a sense of how should we address or what part should we play in this current moment. When we talk about a Haitian solution, I really want us to think critically and problematize that, to to think about what a Haitian solution means. It's a buzzword that I've heard since 2018, um, batted around in various um, circles, uh, trying to propose, trying to argue that we need different kinds of solutions, different kinds of narratives about Haiti, but we need a Haitian solution to the current political crisis. When we talk about the violence of this moment, I want us to remember the violence that the diaspora is um, experiencing, the violence of not being able to go home, the powerlessness um, that those the that of those who have always supported their Haitian families, Haitian organizations, Haitian sovereignty, and Haitian humanity, um, folks who have always supported this from wherever they are are also experiencing a trauma and a violence in this moment. The Haitian diaspora, um, Haitians uh, living abroad. Um, the number is close to over 2 million since 2022, and that has doubled since, 2000, since 2010, since the earthquake. The largest communities are in the United States, the Dominican Republic, Chile, Canada, Brazil, and France. There have been multiple, there have been lots of um, attention to the ways that their involvement, the involvement of the diaspora has shifted over time. One thing I want to focus on today is Haitian remittances, the the um, support, financial support that Haitians living abroad are able to offer the um, Haitians in Haiti. That reached over 3.1 billion US dollars in 2022. But this has been, this has been declining in the current political moment because of insecurity of payment networks, the rampant robberies and bank attacks. Um, the, the old solution of thinking about Haitian remittances as a way to stabilize or, um, support supplement the Haitian economy is no longer present. The weakened state in in Haiti right now, the food insecurity, the political vacuum that was created by the assassination in 2021, all of these um, pose real problems, real complicated problems with um, different perspectives among the diaspora about what processes, what strategies should we use, should we deploy to address the current situation and the deep historical causes. There are many who feel like we shouldn't be focusing on Haitian history right now, but we should be focusing on Haitian futures. But I challenge us to think about um, what we mean when we talk about this uh, this inclusive and just Haitian solution. What kinds of policies, economic policies, foreign policies, migration policies are needed to create a sustainable change in the country right now? Haitians have to be involved wherever they are. 
I think one of the most important things that the diaspora community does, especially the diaspora community in the United States, one of the most important things that we do is keeping the focus on Haiti, keeping Haiti in the headlines when there are so many um, ways and reasons why we might shift our focus away from Haiti. We're starting to see that happen. These one dimensional image, these one dimensional um, pictures of what's going on in Haiti um, are not are are no longer acceptable when you have a large diaspora community that is pushing back against um, the platitudes that we hear from government officials, from um, quote unquote representatives of um, Haitian um, thought, and who are really challenging. Um, the current leaders to have more, um, more thoughtful, more, more, um, com complex, um, responses to what's going on in Haiti right now. Happy to hope, open it up for questions. Thank you very much. And yeah, we're inviting questions both from the room, but also, uh, people online. So, um, uh, and also from our speakers, if you have questions for each other, mm -hmm. we start on starting the question. Uh, wait a few seconds. Let's start with a very practical question, which is: uh, I was wondering, Lerby, what your what the electricity situation is like in your practice? How much electricity you have? What you can get? And I also wanted to learn a little bit more about how you go about knowing to keep safe. So actually, as mentioned, you know, hearing gunshots in the area, yes or no, whether or not we go out. But I also remember WhatsApp groups that I was a part of living in Haiti that were very important for deciding whether or not to leave the house. So I was wondering if you could comment on, uh, on those two issues. Thank you. Excuse me, Felix. So the question is about um, electricity in my practice. How uh, um, um, the electricity from the grid is not that much. Probably for probably six six hours a day. Mostly it's from um, a generator, and we are using fuel. So usually that's that's how we do it. Um, I'm I'm a radiologist, so I need electricity 24 7 i i read a lot of imaging do a lot of ultrasound studies um i my specialty depends on on electricity so um the clinic i i, I have a, a, a practice in pétionville um which is as i said earlier one of the 20 percent <laughs> what part of the 20 percent that is not yet controlled the gang start it, it tried um, to uh, um, to take control of Petionville, but they were pushed back by the police force and the population. Um, in several areas, you people have a, have set barricades. You know, um, ev several neighborhoods in Haiti have become gated communities because the the, the, the population has set barricades. Barricades where where you were living, Felix, um, in Port-au-Prince, where you were living uh, um, when you were in Haiti. Um, you would have to cross like three or four barricades um, before you get to your home, and that's how people um, are feeling safe right now. That's that's their that's how they react. You no, know, they set barricades so they control the flow of vehicles, the flow of motorcycles, and control the and they patrol. They they have established vigilante groups, and they are trying to control their own area. Um, so for electricity, that's how it is. In terms of hearing gunshots, um, you hear gunshots probably in all power prints right now. Even when you are in the twenty, when uh, um, in the areas that are not gang controlled, you can still hear the gunshots from afar. Yeah, I, 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 I don't, I don't know if there was another question. Sorry, I was wondering about whether the internet's still working or they use WhatsApp to kind of keep safe, not least because I think the internet's working through uh, diesel generators. So I'm wondering whether these are... Internet. Uh, yeah, yeah. Internet. So you have... Pe mostly people are using the internet from their mobile devices. Uh, that's, that's what people use. So um, you have uh, two uh, um, 
um, in, um, cell phone providers, they both provide, um, they offer internet connections both on your cell phone and through modems. Um, some of them offer optic fiber internet, but I don't know if they can still go to the gun control area to, you know, do maintenance or still provide internet through optic fiber there. Um, we have a, um, a, a new player in the game right now, but it's mostly for people who can afford it. Really, you can afford it. It's quite expensive. It's the Starlink internet um, from... Uh, um, uh, um, module from um, the elon musk company so some people are buying that but it's 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 really a fraction really a tiny fraction of the population so mostly people are using internet through the mobile devices thank you very much tom adamson question. you're welcome yeah i just wanted to speak to the, the problem i agree with most of what the the presenters have spoken about the security is the the most important problem right now in Haiti and that the so much else cannot be achieved without security and uh the thing is that right now the uh right now the the um uh the Haitian police and army together are less than 10,000 uh uh forces whereas if you look at the Dominican Republic uh which has approximately the same population they have perhaps 10 times as many security forces as we do in Haiti. And this, this is something that has to be addressed. And it's it, these, the, the kinds of numbers we need between army and police, we need at least 30, 40,000, uh, security forces in order to, to put a lid on, on the country. And we don't have that now. We're never going to receive that from the international community. So, uh, I think the the international community has to recognize this fact, and we have they have to start uh, a plan where they can train quickly as possible uh, security forces, either police or army, to be able to uh, to to control the gangs. Without that, it, there's nothing. And uh, as as Larry was just saying, that people are making barricades. Uh, I, I was evacuated by the Canadian embassy last week. But I have two daughters who are still in Haiti, and uh, the quartier where we live, uh, along we have a street, and we have now put in bar uh, barrier, not just barricades, but barrier blocking uh, at either end of the street. So th those gates will be open during the day, but then at night we're going to close them to to stop the bad guys coming through. Because we did have an incident about two weeks ago. Where the bad guys came onto our street, uh, uh, but they were stopped by the police. Anyway, that's it. Unless you want more comments on other things. Um, no, thank you. If you could just introduce yourself briefly, Tom, uh, give us a little bit. Of yeah, I'm I'm a Canadian citizen, but I've been li living in Haiti since 1978. Uh, I have a business. I manufacture mattresses for the local market. The company is called Mikama. Uh, and uh, I have a factory in Dikini that I have not been able to visit in 16 months because of gang activity between me and the factory. The factory still works. We pay our workers. Uh, and the, the trucks go through by paying a tariff uh, when they go through the gang-occupied uh, areas. but. Uh, Myself and my daughter who work with me, they, we haven't been able to go ourselves because we would be worried about uh, kidnapping. Uh, I myself, I was kidnapped. I spent a week in uh, Village de Dieu. Uh, and uh, luckily, my daughter no negotiated my return uh, against a ransom. And uh, uh, happily, everything turned out well. But it's very dangerous living in Paul Prince these days. I think it's important when we talk about security in Haiti that we also keep in mind food insecurity and the number of Haitians who are living under conditions of almost starvation because of the lack of, of food in Haiti. Um, I want us to always, you know, there's so much conversation about 
security forces and um, arms and guns and and police and armies. Um, I, I also it's important to also hear about humanitarian um, the humanitarian crisis and solutions that also include food and clean water, like um, we discussed a bit on the panel. We also have a question from the room right now from uh, my colleague, Jorge Nunez. Go ahead, Nunez. Uh, oh, thank you, everyone. Thank you for the presentations. They were really informative. And and, and, and so the situation is so sad. that uh, I, I have a question because I've been kind of, a, uh, I'm from Ecuador. Uh, and we have a gang problem. And in Ecuador, the gangs were kind of fostered by the state within prisons uh, because the state started using the prison population as kind of the main informant of cocaine market. So you, you have the role of the state in the production of gang violence was crucial. Uh, could you say something about the, the history of gangs in Haiti? Uh, and and when it, it began, and if the state had a, a role in there, uh, and yeah, just information about the gangs, if you feel, please. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Let's uh, see, Jan, I think this, do you, do you mind starting on this one? Um, sure. I mean, this is such a complex question, and I have, um, Oops, and I have um colleagues such as um um James James Olivier who really works on the issue of the gang, and of course um historian Michel Suka has also done some research. It's a complex um situation, and many of the gangs are funded again, by Haitians and non-Haitians outside of the country and by politicians. And we have to remember that the issue of the gang violence is not new. Going as far back as the early 2000s on the Aristide, you know, uh, we have to differentiate Aristide number two. You know, when I talk about Aristide, like second, um, the, the second Aristide, the first Aristide, you know, it was a different ball game. There were the Shime, and also what has been said and that has been um, challenged. There's there's a really good film called Deported by Rachel Magloire, and she shows how, in many ways, when the I think the film is from two thousand. 13, but she took footage, she's a documentarist from like mid to late 2000, like between maybe 2006 to 2008 or so, and um, showing that at some point people were blaming the Haitians who were deported from the U.S. Um, to Haiti, and they were blaming them. They were just calling them, ah, they deported, et cetera, et cetera. But it's, it's very layered. And, and complex, and it's being supported by different sector because who's the money is being that's coming in that the gangs are getting? It's coming from outside of Haiti. The banks are in it, and I remember I think it was maybe twenty twenty two. There was a um, there, there was a um, there was a report from one of the Canadian journal. I can't remember which one. Um, a uh, newspaper writer, where they say that uh, it it was shown that some of the politicians, including former President Michel Martelly and others, they sh they show that they were show they were supporting gangs with money that were coming out of Canada. So it's a real problem, but also it's a problem that was created, and um, we are being recorded. And I have to worry about my family safety. There are certain things I cannot say in this medium. But if the people who created this problem, if they wanted to um, resolve it, I give them a week. And that's me being generous. They will, they will handle the gang problem. And that's all I'll say. Yeah, Rose, you were raising your hand. Well, I, 
I don't have a lot to say in the gangs in history, but I, it's a very good question with, I'm sure, many answers, as Dr. Cecile mentioned. But I did want to address both two questions in the chat, um, from one from Blondine and one from Nan. Um, Blondine, you asked about uh, how it works in paying the gang members when you travel from one zone to another. And that is very... Um, Everywhere is different, but one thing I like to help people recognize right now is if you know the geography of Haiti, Port-au-Prince is kind of stuck in, in this little corner. So to get up north and to get down south into the, into the shape of Haiti, there are basically two roads, one this way, one this way. And because most of the ports come in there, you must, to distribute the goods, you have to go out that way. And basically the gangs have blocked off both of those ro routes. So one of the biggest struggles is everything that goes out, the price is excessively inflated because you have to pay taxes to get it out. Anything that needs to come in is excessively inflated because you have to pay these gang tax to get it in. So it's a culture where nothing is, is fully, I mean, it's a small island nation that doesn't create a lot of its own things. So a lot of things have to be imported. On the other hand, all local produce, avocados, mangoes and stuff are coming from out in the countryside. So you might have the onions in the mountains, but the oil to cook them in, in the city and neither the two shall meet because you you need to pay such a large taxes. So in that sense, that is adding to the potential of starvation um, because the prices of, of foods and things are running. So I, I only mentioned that. So many good questions, so much, and, and I know our time is running thin. But Nan, you asked so many great things. And the one thing I wanted to address is your very words, I'm going to quote you, what can those of us who are privileged do to help? And I think that's a question we all can ponder with in life in general. We don't have to talk about Haiti. There's problems around the world. We can go to Palestine. We can talk about the Gaza Strip. We can talk in Ukraine. But I think our world is suffering. Um, I started an organization called Peace Cycle because I really think we need a cycle of peace. And one thing I think that can happen is breaking down ignorance, just knowing that other people are not living a prestigious, perfect, simple life. Um, can help us start to open the doors of finding ways to help and find solutions. So I don't have any answers to your question of what we can do to help. I mean, of course, as a, as a um, social business person, I always think supporting local the best you can in those situations, um, helping the organizations buy locally and things like that, rather than shipping things in. But those things are often also difficult, but um, just breaking down ignorance, sharing this video series or, or this um, conference with other people or sharing what you have heard, um, following groups on their Facebook pages or Instagrams or reading on their websites can help us be less ignorant. But I digress. Uh, so many great questions, not a lot of answers, but thank you all for participating too. We've got another question in the chat that by Ana Elisa Santiago, who is an anthropologist uh, from Chile, who writes about Haitians in Chile, and she does very good work. Uh, and Ana also gives me another question. Yes. So the question is, um, given the security issues um, are currently the primary concern, how do you view the possibility of another UN peacekeeping operation? Um, I don't know if Anna wants to give more context, but if not, I would like to ask the speakers. I'm sorry, she's a Brazilian researcher, sorry about that. Well, uh, if I may, um, um, we've had a, a really a number of peacekeeping operations in Haiti. Uh, I think for the last 20 years, we've had like 10, 10 of them. Yeah, because if I, uh, we had Minister, Minira, we have the Bini right now. We have, um, the UN is in, in Haiti right now. There is a civil UN mission in Haiti called the Bini right now in Haiti. So they mostly civil. Um, the problem I've always, um, find with, while um, reflecting or studying peacekeeping missions is um, they just come 
and try to suppress um, violence, but not helping address the root causes of the violence and not helping the Haitians do what they think should be done to get rid of the, the cycle of violence. Um, if you want to come and help, come and help us organize a great election. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be three months or three months, six months, and that's it. Don't come in Haiti and stay for 20 years. The last mission stayed for 20 years. If you're staying for 20 years, I don't know what you are doing. I, I, I can understand that. Um, so, yeah, um, right now, um, the situation is such that uh, the police and the army forces, as Tom put it earlier, um, we are, they are outgunned. They are outnumbered. Right now, you, you, you kind of need help to get to, to, to take care of that situation. The, the armed trafficking right now in Haiti is heavy. Um, guns are coming from the U.S., coming from South America, um, transiting through Haiti, going somewhere else. Drug, also, there is a drug trafficking uh, that is taking place right now also. So there are interests, um, really heavy interests. If the international wants to come and help, that's my humble opinion. Um, as Rose said it earlier, if you think that you understand the situation, the Haiti situation completely, there's something that you are, you are probably, uh, um, not taking, not taking into consideration because it's, it's such a complicated situation. Um, but if we can find help right now to kind of, um, take care of the humanitarian crisis, people are being raped right now. People are being kidnapped right now. People are being, ki are, are, are being killed on a regular basis. Um, people are being forced to, to leave their homes. People are losing their jobs. People are losing their businesses. It's a, it's a, it's a cataclysm as, as, uh, um, Professor Axelia put it earlier. So right now we need something. We need something to stop the bleeding. Professionals are leaving the country. Doctors are leaving. Um, we have to, we have to put a hold on, you no, know, freeze, freeze the situation. Okay. Let's stop the cycle of violence right now. Let's see what we can do to restore the state authority, to restore um, peace, um, help the, the kids go back to school, help the mothers take care of the children, help the businesses to, to breathe and try to regenerate themselves. That's what we have, we have to do right now. And I think we desperately need help to make that happen. Yeah, and, and also um, the, the awareness. I mean, the way the um, international uh, countries outsiders speak about Haiti, you know, the media, whether we're talking about France, Canada, and the U.S., you will think that Haitians are just sitting there waiting for the blanc or foreigner does not mean white, but it, it really means foreigner, not necessarily white. Um, how they're just waiting for them. People don't talk about the grassroots organization. There are people in Haiti who has the possibility to live, who choose to stay. We have colleagues who have stayed, I was born in Haiti, I will die in Haiti. We don't hear this narrative. We don't hear about the fact that in spite of everything, people were protesting. People do not want another occupation. And that's what, let's call it what it is. It's, it hasn't been intervention. It's been multiple occupations in the plural. And who benefits? We don't talk about when minister, you know, you and whatever guys they want to call it, the raping of women, the violence, the countless number of children that they leave behind. When we're talking about help, also, who is at the table? Who has the chairs at the table? How can you not involve women in participating in this conversation? How can you not involve the youth? And, 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 and this is a big part of it. Who's, it's always the same question. Who is at the table and who gets to decide? And, and, and it's, it's, it's so complex. And as, as Dean Jackson said, you know, the role of the diaspora. I have a friend who recently said, 
um, when there's a wedding, they call the diaspora. When there's a funeral, a communion, baptism, etc. But when it comes to participation, and I'm not saying that those of us we're gonna stay in the US and say this is what has to be done, but we have skills. One of the things that really annoys me is how there's an ongoing conversation, even from the earthquake. How dare that it was Bill Clinton who was the core, whatever his his title was, as if there were no Haitians. You know how many Haitian professionals from lawyers to doctors to political sciences um in the US and Canada. And so, but they're not bringing these people well to be part of the conversation. Those are the conversations we also need to have. Thank you very much. I know that Anna wants to jump in. If, if she does, that's great. And if she doesn't, I'll move on to the last question. Uh, we've had two questions by Nan Shepard. I'm going to choose one which is what can academics, researchers, and teachers do? I'm an anthropologist, but my master's is in public international law. How do we direct policy research in the most useful way? I'd love to hear from maybe from the researchers in the room who have a lot of experience with this, because I, I have no answer to this question. I think in <laughs> I think it is it is tough being a um, being a Haitian academic, being a um, academic who studies Haiti, who's connected to Haiti. Um, this is this is a difficult time. Just as um, I remember be, during the earthquake or after the earthquake, um, feeling that as a sociologist. Um, what in the world did I have to offer when there were when what we needed were nurses and doctors and engineers to um, address the problem? But I think the work that academics and researchers do is critically important. Again, in keeping the focus on Haiti and and really think and really challenging these simple solutions. Right with historical analysis, with cultural and um, with cultural and, and analysis, with analysis that really shows the multi dimensions of these problems and and how we got here. Um, really focusing on the root causes of um, the situation in Haiti and um, and those kinds of solutions that are sustainable and that really do address some of the um some of the foundational issues that got us here in the first place i think if we keep the focus on the surface and um and with the short-sighted sort of perspective on um on what's going on and how it should be addressed um i think that we'll we're going to see a repeat of this cycle of violence that we have been in in haiti for um for many many years and so I think the important work that academics do, that anthropologists do, um, that other um, people in other fields can do is to, is to really offer that critical historical perspective on where we are now and on what should be done. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank all of the participants once again. Thank you very much uh, for being with us today, for sharing your time and your knowledge. We will, um, I also want to thank again the uh, Department of Anthropology at the University of Amsterdam and Center for Conflict Studies. And we will send you the, the recording of this, um, of this event, both to all the speakers, but also to all participants. And we'd be very grateful if you could share this with whoever you think may be interested. Thank you very much and uh, take care. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, and bye bye.